Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of themindrenewed.com, coming to you from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And today I'm very pleased to be speaking with John Booth, who is a Yorkshire-born journalist, educator, photographer and political activist based in London, who has worked for news organisations in places as far afield as Africa, the US and the UK. He currently writes for Lobster, which uh, is an online magazine researching into, it says, uh, politics, parapolitics and history. And I was wondering what parapolitics is, but from the description it sounds what one might call the deep state. And uh, he also writes for LAFZ, the magazine for Pakistani diaspora. And he is also a founder member of the Orgreave Truth and Justice Campaign. John, thanks very much for joining us on The Mind Renewed. It's a pleasure to be with you, Julian. Well, we're going to be talking today about well, what I think is a really excellent article that you wrote recently and you, you had published in this uh, latest edition of Lobster Magazine, which is called 15 Years On From 9-11, which you very kindly drew my attention to. I think it was just about a week ago, something like that, just over a week ago. And the reason why I want to chat to you about this and make people aware of it, really, is because I think it's a very good introduction to the to the whole business of questioning what happened on 9-11 or you know, what were officially told happened on 9-11. A lot of people, of course, do have questions about that day, but it can be very daunting to uh, look into and wade through the mass of information that's out there, particularly on the internet. And uh, this is where I think your article excels, because it does offer us a kind of guide to some of the key issues about 9-11, points us in, in some very good directions, because you've got a lot of links, a lot of footnotes and things which can be really helpful for people. So I think we'll have a chat about this article in a moment, but could we first of all turn to you, John, could you tell us more about your work as a journalist, and uh, perhaps why you decided to write for publications like Lobster and LAFZ? Thanks, Julian. Well, I trained as a journalist uh, many years ago now on local newspapers in various parts of Britain um, and then lived abroad and uh, I worked for a newspaper in Harare when I lived in Zimbabwe many years ago. Uh, and I also, as a postgraduate student, lived in Washington, D.C., where I also worked for the Washington Post. And that was a few years after Watergate. Uh, ben Bradley was still the editor and Bob Woodward was still working there. Uh, and I came back to Britain at the end of the 70s and returned to mainstream journalism at The Guardian and then subsequent other publications and then to training journalists. And along the way, living abroad, meeting people from other societies and fortunately meeting all kinds of people in politics and other areas, I quickly uh, fairly quickly came to the conclusion after 9-11 that we weren't really getting much questioning or interrogation of the quick version that was immediately apparent uh, to anybody who turned on TV, that it was a bunch of crazy fanatical Muslims taking planes and demolishing buildings and so on. Mm. But I didn't have time uh, at the time of 9-11 to pass over it. Like most people, we have busy lives and lots of things to get on with. Uh, and I also knew along the way that it was very unlikely that the conventional mainstream media would have the resource, you know, because they're struggling in terms of resource, uh, and also partly a question of ownership and political priorities to be looking into 9-11. And Lobster Magazine, which I've known for a long time, the editor is based in Hull, Robin Ramsey is an old friend of mine, and we've often discussed various issues over the years and he's rigorous in the material he's written in Lobster and in a series of books. He uh, wrote a book about Colin Wallace, he wrote a book about Harold Wilson and the uh, MI5 business and he's rigorous and demanding that uh, stuff that appears uh, is well resourced and uh, well sourced and well footnoted and that kind of rigor I know isn't often applied in the mainstream media even if they turn their attention to it so now I have a little more time in the last 18 months. I thought it was time to look at it and was prompted in part by meeting one person who's had a relative who died in the Twin Towers and then slowly but surely becoming aware that there's a whole world of material online and in books, much of which had not uh, come through the mainstream media to my attention. 
and I had time and I thought 9-11 was such a transformative event in this century that it was worth a little effort trying to pull together the best I could from many sources and help other people who equally might be curious but also be busy to begin to research it for themselves. Yes, absolutely. You know, what you said there very much connects with the feeling that I had about it when I read it, that, you know, it is very well written. Many, many sources there are quoted. You know, it's obviously a quality piece of writing that was very clear. And I think it is a very good resource for people to, for their own research and to share with other people. And you were talking about the the impact that 9-11 had on you initially. I got the impression that you were sort of suspicious about it from the word go. Is that the case? Well, I set it in context, Julian. I'd lived in the United mm. States, and I've got lots of American friends. One was visiting here, uh, stayed here last week from San Francisco, who worked in Asia for 25 years. And so I've got a number of friends who, who look at the world with not quite the same blinkers as possibly develop when you've lived in just one society all your life. Yeah. And I'd heard in 2000 from friends in the United States that the incoming Bush administration um, was serious in wanting to wage war on Iraq. And that was in 2000. Um, so I'd been alerted to that possibility. And then when immediately after 9-11, uh, Iraq became a focus of attention uh, in some ways, not directly uh, alleged to have done it, but soon Iraq became very much drawn into the political agenda after Afghanistan. And so being alerted in 2000 to this uh, explicit desire of the people around Bush before he was elected and then before he actually was inaugurated at the beginning of 2001, that that was part of their foreign policy intention. And then subsequent to that, we've now heard from Many people, many whistleblowers in the United States who were involved in one way or another in the administration, CIA, DIA, NSA, a whole lot of courageous people who've come forward, that in fact that was the case, that Iraq was very much the top of the agenda. In fact, several people, including Lawrence Wilkerson, who was the chief of staff to Colin Powell at the State Department, said Iraq was such a preoccupation in the first part of the Bush administration before 9-11 that it might even have diverted their attention from preventing the attacks. Um, so I was aware of that in 2000, tried in a limited way to alert people here to it, but there was no takers for that in the, the mainstream media. And there's a danger when you're a little left field in lots of things of uh, becoming into a, a little world of your own and regarded as, I don't mind being called centric, but you become regarded as a bit kooky and weird and uh, how come this nice looking bloke sounds so crazy when he gets on to certain <laughs> subjects. You have to, you have to tread you, carefully, but uh, yeah, you remain to true to yourself. But, yeah, yeah. And you don't want to finish up in the Davy Icke category and Alex yeah. Jones and people who very promptly after 9-11 shot off um, with all kinds of things mm. um, and so you don't want to become an adjective do you well <laughs> what, what people say I mean I'm now at an age where people can say anything pretty much and uh, you just go with the flow and, and, and live with it uh, but at the time I was more dependent on generating income and yeah. uh, you have to be very careful when you're self-employed in journalism about the the fields you tread on and there are certain areas and uh, Nick Davis an old Guardian colleague of mine wrote a book called Flat Earth News a few years mm. ago and he describes certain objects, certain areas of uh, as like the third rail on on the train system that career-minded journalists don't go there, yeah. uh, and certainly career-minded politicians don't go there, and to a large extent, I'm afraid, career-minded academics don't go there either, because I think they're afraid of being contaminated with people who are uh, a little kooky on some of these areas. I mean, Robin Ramsey's written a lot yeah. about the JFK assassination going way, way back. That's written off largely by the mainstream media now. Nobody really goes into that area. And so I wanted to avoid that. And the passage of mm. time gives you more opportunity to, to, to stand back from things, I think, a little as well, Julian. 
Yes, well, you say you're of such an age. Well, I presume you're not of such an age to wear slippers at the supermarket, but we are. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm playing cricket on Sunday afternoon, and I'm still suffering the after effects of keeping wicket uh, for 35 overs and 200 squats. So, uh, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not Impressive. at that stage. A year ago, I was cycling the West Bank for the medical aid for Palestinian charity. So it's not that, and I hope my brain's intact. Oh, absolutely. But it is. It is a danger of becoming put in a certain kind of category yeah. with you know tinfoil hat wearer where you become uh, readily dismissed as a crazy crackpot so, you know. that's right it's taken in itself as evidence of senility yes yeah, so quite exactly. um, <laughs> exactly. yeah, um, just um, I want to step back just for a moment from 9-11 of course we're going to go back there immediately but um, uh, I did mention about the all grieve truth and justice campaign and people might be wondering well what on earth is that so could you tell us a little bit about that Yes, it started uh, four years ago. Um, I was actually living in Zimbabwe during the miners' strike, but came back soon after it ended. And I had friends, because I'm from Yorkshire, who were involved in different ways with the miners' strike. Uh, and one of them, as a, a long-standing friend, Barbara Jackson, who was a white-collar member of uh, the NUM during the miners' strike and was out for a year. And I was visiting her and a partner in Sheffield four years ago and she said the group of people were getting together to say what can we do about the injustice that flowed from what became known as the Battle of Orgreave in 1984 where many miners were arrested and put on very serious charges some of which could have resulted in life imprisonment and when it came to trial the whole thing folded because it was discovered that the evidence against them had been fabricated um, and this became a live issue a few years ago because the same police force, South Yorkshire Police, were subsequently found at Hillsborough to have been involved in the fabrication of evidence. And so the Orgreave campaign started four years ago has worked very closely with the Hillsborough families who now managed to get a proper inquest into their lost ones uh, last year. And so it was, it's been one of the things I've been thinking is worthwhile. It's part of this effort to reveal certain aspects of what to many is the hidden history of the United Kingdom as to what went on there. And uh, it's become a very serious cause. We had a meeting last week with the Home Secretary who is now promising a decision in October as to whether there's going to be a full inquiry into war grief and if so, what the kind of inquiry it will be. Will it be like the Hillsborough panel or would it be a judicial inquiry? So I've put some of my, and we're all volunteers, I've just put some of my time and energy into that. Okay, well, turning back to 9-11, uh, one of the pieces that you, one of the works of art, really, that you suggest people engage with is David Hooper's film, which I think is is an excellent film, actually. And one of the things that he stresses in that production is, you know, the psychological strain that he went through coming to terms with the information he was finding out about 9-11. And I just wondered if you had been through any similar process, considering that you do actually suggest that as something that people should engage with. Oh no, I, I, I strongly, I don't know Dave Hooper, I, I, but only by his work uh, and the film. Mm. Um, and it was very, it very resonated deeply with me mm. because when we see the, the pictures from 9 11 and the obvious huge distress and trauma that's been caused to people, it challenges you to think could anybody really have done this in the first place? Whoever did it, uh, that's the first thing, because it was clearly horrific, the largest crime on the United States uh, territory, and the largest probably single cause of deaths in the Civil War, I should think, um, without saying, well, could this possibly be true? And when you start asking questions, you then begin to think, could any of this really have happened? Could people have known and not acted on it? Why was the Bush administration so reluctant to investigate the death of 3,000 mm. people, most of them American citizens? And it, it challenges you. At a, I think it challenges at all kinds of levels, at a rational level. You know, what are the grounds for believing there may be other explanations? At a psychological level, because I think it takes us out of our comfort zone. And in an old-fashioned word, I think at a, at a spiritual level, at an ethical level, can this really be part of who we are as human beings, that something like this could happen? 
and it not be investigated uh, and that people who know more about it, and clearly many people do because there's been much secrecy surrounding so much of 9-11, and keep stum about it for so long when obviously families and relatives, and we saw it on the 15th anniversary, have been obviously so profoundly uh, disorientated uh, by the events. I think it's important to stress this, actually, because those who would criticise what they would call conspiracy theorists very often talk in terms of, oh, well, these are people who want to find something odd going on everywhere in the world. They're looking for the latest scandal. But uh, this doesn't fit with what you've just described, and it doesn't fit with me either. You know, there is that feeling of of real discomfort facing something like this. Um, So I think it's important, as I say, to stress that dimension of it, because it goes against that popular misconception of what every person who's looking into this is is motivated by. I I think it's true, and in many ways it speaks well of us that we are suspicious about that, and because we do like to have a certain degree of security and uh, confidence in, in certain things uh, to actually look into events. But I try to step back from that. And when people accuse me of, uh, of being involved in conspiracy things, uh, the journalist Peter Oborn, who I don't share his political views, but I admire him as a good journalist. And he wrote an excellent book a few years ago, for those who were old enough to remember the anti-apartheid struggle, about Basil Oliveira, the South African cricketer, who came to Britain and wasn't allowed to tour South Africa. And uh, the subtitle of his book uses the word conspiracy uh, because he says clearly there were things going on which prevented Basil Oliveira going to South Africa and which subsequently led to South Africa's exclusion from international sport, which was a conspiracy in that a few people got together and plant certain things, and most of the rest of us weren't in on that. Yeah. And that's the normal nature of things. I mean, I think yes. cricket teams where the people are conspiring to get rid of the captain. I mean, you know, it happens in all kinds of social groups that people get together with an, an agenda which isn't made clear to everybody involved. Um, and that's how, you know, things change in some ways. And, uh, I mean, conspiracy seems to me a reasonably normal human social activity. I totally agree with you. Um, Now, I mean, in this article, you draw attention to books and other resources, and you started off your investigation, you said you were taking the direct approach, and you bought The Eleventh Day, The Ultimate Account of 9-11, an interesting title, The Ultimate Account, uh, by Anthony Summers and Robert Swan. I I confess I've not read either of these books. The other... Robin Swan. Oh, sorry, Robin Robin Swan. Okay. And um, the other one was Solving 9-11, The Deception That Changed the world by Christopher Bolin, is that right? I think Bolin is how he pronounces Bolin? it. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, so you obviously you got these books because they gave very different views on things. Mm. Well, you kind of dismiss both in the end. A little quote from you, a little wider reading quickly confirmed that the 11th hour is no more the ultimate account, in the sense of telling the whole story, than Bolin can be said to have solved 9-11 in his book. Why did you choose those two particular books? Well, because I was trying to come to it as cool as as, as way as I could and ignore sort of the David Icke type view of all the right. thing but from any kind, or the conventional view, which is the one that the mainstream media is largely stuck to and people criticizing it, uh, mm-hmm. dealing in voodoo history and so on. Oh, yeah. uh, and so I thought, well, I'll, I'll look around and see if there's anybody tried in the last few years. And both those books came out, I think, um, Anthony Summers, Robin Swan's book came out on the 10th anniversary from memory. And Christopher Bolin's book, and that he also has a collection of, he'd been reporting on 9-11 from the week after it happened. And I, I thought, well, this will be a quick way into it. And I don't dismiss them. I mean, I think both are, are works of people who are seriously concerned about the issues. And Anthony Summers has a long-standing reputation. He wrote a very good book on Marilyn Monroe. He's a serious operator. And Berlin's been close to the issues, as I say, reporting it week to week uh, for a long time. I think what it comes down to is that the whole issue around 9-11 is hugely complex. And I tried those two books because they were the two I found that were the most recent attempt to look at the whole event in the round. 
Um, there are many people online and in published works in other forms who have looked at particular aspects of the thing. So Kevin Fenton written a very good book in which he's looked at why the warnings from the CIA and the FBI, uh, of which there were very many, were not taken seriously. And that's a particular focus. Graham McQueen's book on the anthrax attack, which I think mm. is a fundamental element within 9-11, focuses very narrowly on that. And I think that's, in a sense, is, is the way forward by people picking up on one aspect of the story and really subjecting it to serious interrogation. Yes. But there's also a need to step back and say, how do these individual bits of work fit into the picture? And that's what I've tried to do in this piece. So I'm not dismissive of, of either of those two books. They tell me a lot. I mean, mm. um, Summer's book is particularly good on the Saudi connection. And that was followed up on a television uh, documentary, the only thing I've seen in mainstream media, which went out last week on, on ITV. And they're particularly following the Saudi connection and the 28 pages, which has become the issue in the, in the media in the last few months about 9-11. And Berlin looks a lot. He lived in Israel um, and he's monitored the uh, effect of the Israel lobby in the United States uh, in, in some detail. And they both have things that are useful to say, but neither to me uh, live up to their rather immodest titles <laughs> in, <laughs> no, in, no. in that they're solving the thing. In, in a sense, I mean, we may never get to know what happened because so much of the evidence of 9-11 was removed very promptly mm. after the attacks and so much of the material has been hidden. Um, a number of the key people involved have died or have chosen to remain silent. Congress has not looked rigorously into 9-11. The 9-11 Commission reports have been largely discredited. And not many politicians, in my experience, whilst they're still politicians as opposed to retired politicians, want to go there. So it may never be so. So I'll look for as many sources as I can to throw light on things without spending the rest of my life well, doing it. Yes, as you say, it's very complicated. You say that the 9-11 Commission report has been discredited, but interestingly, you do recommend that people read it and the NIST reports. I do. And um, going back to what you were saying about looking at particular areas of 9-11, um, I like the way in the article you draw a distinction between the lie hop or my hop approach and this looking at particular areas. I've not really thought of it in that way before. So we have the, the hypothesis, let it happen on purpose or made it happen on purpose. So those are the kind of embracing narratives that people might try to follow. But then you set that against an alternative approach, which is to look at these distinct areas in a lot of detail and perhaps leave the larger narrative on the shelf at the back of your mind. And I think that's an interesting way of approaching it because it does actually move against this way of looking at things which could immediately attract the accusation you're just a conspiracy theorist because essentially what you're doing is researching a particular area. Well, I think it's the only sensible way to do it, to avoid being castigated as a tinfoil hat wearing Looney Tune, um, yes. which is easily dismissed. Uh, and, you know, people have written about this and they are, the, the, the mainstream media readily uh, dismiss this. And they think if you're asking questions, that means you've got the answers. I mean, several people who've read the article have been in touch and, and, and said, well, I don't buy this. I mean, an ex-MP wrote to me, I don't buy it. I can't buy this. I'm up for a conspiracy theory, but I, but I can't buy this. So I replied and said, I'm not wanting you to buy anything. I'm not, yes. I'm not in the selling business in this. I've done this in my own time for no financial reward or political reward or anything. I'm simply saying here is a major event in our history. We remember it. There are still people dying as a result of this through the toxic dust they inhaled. There are people who have lost loved ones from whom they and their children will never recover. And we need to address this in a rational way. And I'm not going to be able to come up with everything, but I think it's sufficiently important for people younger than me, and they're the people who I, I now concentrate on. And last week, the son of one of my cricket mates said, 
you know, he's got a pal at school who's uh, who's doing 9-11 as a research project, and he was really pleased to get hold of this. Right. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to batter over the head the people who've got a closed mind on this, who've got a, a simple solution. There isn't a simple thing. I think we're better than that. I think that's why we've got mm. minds, and the online yes. facility allows us to exercise our minds on a complex but very important topic. Yes, you are clearly asking questions in this piece, but what is of interest to me is there have been some sort of rhetorical flourishes coming out on the internet over the last few years by various people criticising, in inverted commas, conspiracy theorists, and then saying, ah, but these days they say they're just asking questions, as if you're sort of hiding behind that. And I do think that is really underhand, because if you can't ask questions, then we might as well just shut off all our minds and live in a cave, you know. I think it's true. I think we we all we all know uh, in daily life that there is asking questions and there's asking rhetorical questions and there's asking pointed questions Mm -hmm. so when some people say they're just asking questions um, it may be that they're asking questions in such a way that they think they already know the answers and the people they're addressing they want to reach the same conclusion but that's not nuanced in the pieces I'm referring to exactly exactly it's not at all and we live Obviously, in a world of, you know, 24-hour news cycle, um, people are are wanting quick responses to everything. Uh, There is, to a degree, that uh, thing that John Burt identified many years ago, the bias against understanding, which is that it takes time to look into into anything very much. And we've had all of that with the EU referendum of people saying, we didn't get enough information. If we'd only we've known this and only we'd have known that. Well, to me, asking questions is, is the only rational way to go about these things. Well, let's do some asking questions. I mean, this piece is, well, I mean, it's 40-odd pages long. It's almost like a little book, really. You cover an awful lot of ground. Um, So there are many dimensions to 9-11 that we could discuss. We're obviously limited in what we can do here. So (laughs) what I thought I would do is to ask you if there are one or two areas, perhaps, that particularly bug you that you'd like to share with us. So off you go. Is there anything that you'd like to share with us that really gets under your skin about this whole business? I think that one of the things is not just the reluctance of the Bush administration to ask questions about 9-11, but their positive resistance to having any formal inquiry. Mm. When you see a lot of the online material in the name of the so-called Jersey Girls, who were four of the widows who really pushed and knocked on doors in Congress and the White House and the media to get an inquiry as to why they all lost their husbands and have no apparent rational explanation for what went on. What comes over to me, and I found it very powerful, one of them, Mindy Kleinberg, who I quote in the piece, said, 3,000 people have died here. Wouldn't you think the head of the US government would want to do everything possible to find out why? And if there were things that were deficient in the process of protecting the United States, the most powerful nation in the world, from attack in this way, he would do everything possible to find out what went wrong and put it right and bring people who are in responsible positions on that day to book. Mm. In fact, the opposite happened. Quite a number of the people in responsible positions, that, including Condoleezza Rice and her deputy and the deputy joint chief of staff, were all promoted Mm. after Mm. 9-11. And you link to a a very remarkable question and answer. There was Senator Tom Daschle, Mm. where he was actually told, you know, I was told by the vice president, don't look into the uh, intelligence problems surrounding 9-11. Don't do it. No investigation. Cheney was absolutely adamant in his uh, attempt to stop that. I mean, you feel for these families that were living with this Mm. instant bereavement Um, I mean, awful stories of messages being left on their answer machines from husbands trapped in the Twin Towers. And that's the last they heard from them. So to go through that personal agony and their children, too, of forcing them to have to put their personal grief on the line in order to get a very basic inquiry into a fundamental. It was a crime of enormous proportions. And the resistance to that by the Bush administration. And then finally, over a year later, when Bush finally conceded that there had to be an inquiry, 
um, the person he appointed to chair it was Henry Kissinger, <laughs> who was, the, you know, historically, wherever your politics are, is a master of, at, at best, cover-up. It was a, re a real insult, wasn't it? And, it was, and we only know from the film, it didn't got into much mainstream media. The only reason he came off that job of yeah. chairing it was because the families, mm. the victims' families, actually went to his office. Yes, and right. asked him explicitly, do you have any direct interest with Saudi Arabia in your commercial activities? <laughs> you know, could you tell us about your connection with bin Laden? Mm. And within days, if not the following day, he'd resigned yeah. because he was clearly conflicted in his interest. Yeah. This was, is it 9-11 Press for Truth where there's that interview with the lady who actually talked with Kissinger? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, and she says that he almost fell off the sofa when she... Yes, well, exactly. I mean, these were, these were not only bereaved women, but they were smart and angry women. Mm. And they weren't going to be put off by the classic, you know, lubricant in these situations. Oh, move on, deal with it, move on. Right. They were angry and they wanted to know why they were bereaved and why their children would have no father. And they weren't about to take easy platitudes from... Bush or anyone else. And I think that incredible resistance to inquiry mm. is something that immediately alerted me to say, well, why would they not want to know this, to put things right? It's, it's suspicious behavior. It, I mean, some people would call it guilty demeanor in similar circumstances. If something had happened here, and an offence took place which involved the death of someone and the responsible authorities resisted any inquiry, they would say, what have they got to hide? And yes. they'd be right to ask that question. And of course, connected to this unwillingness to investigate, or real resistance to investigate, mm. goes the uh, clamping down on whistleblowers as well. And you say in the piece, you know, people often say, oh, well, where are the whistleblowers? Well, they're not the most popular people, and uh, they get silenced. And you point to Thomas Drake and Colleen Rowley, and um, and I would think of uh, Sibel Edmonds. I'm not sure whether you, you mentioned her in the, in the piece or not. Uh, but, uh, make a they had a hard time. They did, and, I mean, part of the whole effort to sort of keep this whole business, I think, under wraps is to say, well, surely if something like this had happened, people would know about it and tell us. Mm. Well, the truth is that pretty much since 19, 15 years, Lots of people with detailed information within their areas of government, whether it's Thomas Drake or the NSA, Michael Schur at the CIA, Bin Laden group, a whole bunch of people in the FBI who were getting reports coming in that people were taking flying lessons. And the pattern uh, which seems to have been established, as far as I can see, Kevin Fenton's particularly good on this with um, the NSA and the CIA, but lots of other people have, have covered other areas of government, is that there were people reporting things which pointed very clearly to attacks, pointed very clearly to suspicious behavior by people living within the United States. They were filing reports in a professional way, and these reports were going up the respective hierarchies of their organization and hitting a glass ceiling. And with a report from one lawyer who was a friend of the Attorney General, John Ashcroft, and Ashcroft looked the other way. But in July 2001, the Attorney General stopped taking commercial flights. <laughs> he refused to take it and wouldn't answer questions, why are you not taking it? Now, this was three months before 9-11, and there seems to be a pattern of which this, this reporting up just hits a certain point, and then the people above them in their own organizational hierarchies and then the political people within the White House administration choose either basically to avert their gaze or to consciously to, to, to dismiss all of this and of course subsequently deny what went on even yeah. though Condoleezza Rice was finally in 2004 forced to release the, the message that had come through in the presidential daily briefing of something had a, you know, a armor poised to strike within the United States and had denied anything like that had ever been happened. So this attempt to prevent inquiry is something that raises questions, as, as it does in our normal life. We can put up with frustrations in life on the, if the train doesn't run, if somebody will explain to us why the train isn't running. <laughs> we may not like it, 
but it's a response on which we can make then rational judgments and say, well, okay, do I get on my bike or do I catch a bus? I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't quite know what to make of Richard Clark's statement that came out a few years ago, but I mean, it, it's got to make people think, you know, whatever you conclude about it, that he you know, oh, sure. said that there were a couple of hijackers, the alleged hijackers, who were actually being followed by the CIA. And he should have received information from George Tenet about that. It should have come through to his computer and he would have known about it. And he said that it must have been specifically blocked. Yep. And then he, he speculated that, well, maybe the reason is that the CIA wanted to uh, hire these as agents or something. Also, but, I mean, uh, yeah. yeah, that's right. But whatever you make of that, that is really weird and has got to raise questions in people's minds, I think. I think so. I mean, there's the thing that really struck me when I looked into it, too, is that Norman Minetta, who was the transport secretary in the Bush administration, gives evidence to say that he was with Dick Cheney uh, when news of an aircraft approaching the Pentagon came in. And his evidence suggests very strongly that Cheney didn't want to do anything to prevent that. And he's on record, and I put the links into the piece, of him saying that, but this testimony doesn't appear anywhere in the 9-11 Commission report. Now, with all of these things, you have to have a caution uh, that anybody involved in anything which leads to trouble is going to do his or her best to exculpate themselves from any responsibility. And right. there are personal rivalries. You know, Clark was inherited from the Clinton administration and wasn't necessarily trusted by the Republicans and therefore had a motive. And as with anything, when you're a journalist and people come to you with a story, a question that you have to ask is what's their motivation for this person telling me this piece of information? Yeah, good point. Is it jealousy? Is it rivalry? Is it professional antipathy? Mm. Is it vengeance? Are they having an affair with his wife? You know, these are the basic questions. And the libel laws in this country, which I've been teaching for many years, require that journalists check on sources of information that there might be mixed motives in it. But what you've also got to say, well, there are also lots of people who are saying different things, particularly now the professional, the architects and engineers on the high rise buildings and say, well, what possible motive could they have? for jeopardizing their businesses and their reputations by asking awkward questions about the collapse of the three skyscrapers in New York. And a balanced view is to say, okay, we can recognize that people may have certain mixed motives in saying what they're saying, but let's look at the seriousness of the allegation and check it for its actual worth against other sources. And that's what I'm seeking to encourage people to do in this piece. You are indeed. Um, let me just go back to Norman Mineta just for a second now. I've, I've always found that very, very suspicious. Mm. However, a question mark has been raised in my mind in recent months by somebody who drew my attention to the 9-11 Myths website. Yes. It's got some interesting stuff in there, I have to admit. And there's a, there's a piece on... Yes, that that's too. right. Um, mm -hmm. that. I don't always like the tone of it, but nevertheless, you know, you can, you can yeah. always uh, sift that out, can't you? you really We've all got friends whose tone we don't like. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. But there's, there, that's, there are some part of mm -hmm. human life, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. But there's some gems in there, and um, obviously yeah. I've not, not looked at any anywhere near as much of information as there actually is there, and I need to continue doing so. But uh, there's a piece on Norman Mineta there that's very interesting, where they make the claim that he is an unreliable witness because of some of the other mm. things he said with respect to the events on that day. So you know, I think that needs to be held in the balance there in our estimation yeah, sure. of that information. But I still think it's very suspicious. However, yeah. I think so, and I mean, people, I, I don't know, you've been on a, a a jury julian or not but i've been on no. a jury a couple of times and you know as a reporter i've spent lots of times covering court cases and inquests and things and all the time you're in this business of assessing is this person a real does this person seem a reliable witness does he or she have other motivations for appearing here and, and saying that but that's what we all do in human life every day, don't we? And all I'm asking people to do is to look at some of the material there and make your own judgment about that. And my, my anxiety and the reason I do this stuff is because I think there is a lot of material there which most people, including lots of friends of mine who are capable, intelligent, decent people, didn't even know existed. A large number of people, for example, don't know that three towers came down that day. 
a lot of people don't know that two senior members of the US Senate were targeted for assassination with anthrax. And when they discover that, they say, this is extraordinary. How come we've never heard this? You still find that today, that people oh, that are not aware of Building 7 even today? Oh, no, absolutely not. And uh, the, the, one of the things that really has struck me a lot and was very powerful to me uh, was the fact that as part of a thousand people, I think a little more than a thousand people who died in New York that day were atomized. Mm. There's no evidence capable of DNA sampling. And this to me is an absolutely extraordinary state of affairs because from what I'm able to tell um, when buildings collapse in whatever form, it's possible to know at least to find something, maybe dismembered elements of their body or something, dental record, something which allows the bereaved to say, well, we know she was there. And for over a thousand people to have nothing left of them, whatever, seems to me it's almost beyond belief. Uh, But it's true. It is true. Um, And a lot of people don't know that. And I think you know, if I can alert a few more people to that possibility and for them to examine them for themselves, how that might have come about, then it will have been worth it. Yeah. So what would you say, I mean, in talking there about the forensic aspect of things, what would you say are the, the most impactful elements of the forensic questioning about 9-11 for you? I think the fact that there's never been a serious forensic inquiry I quote in the piece at some length an article written four months after 9-11 by the editor of a magazine which goes to the firefighters in the United States. And he is appalled at the fact that the crime scene, 3,000 people dying, you couldn't call it anything other than a crime scene, was being disturbed from day one. Mm. The evidence was being removed Um, that large parts of what was left of the three towers was not only removed from ground zero, but shipped to Asia to be recycled. And he said, this won't do, uh, because he's writing on behalf of firefighters, who he said are the first into buildings and often the last out. And we owe it to them, never mind to the victims, to know exactly how these buildings came down And when that happens in any of the circumstances, like at an air crash, the scene is protected. I mean, somebody was murdered not far from where I live at the moment. That site was protected 24 hours by the police for nearly two weeks. Mm. And no one was allowed to go anywhere near it. And yet, ground zero, there were people walking over it and removing things and the whole structure of the whole building, what was left of the pulverized remains, was largely removed. And so what Bill said in the piece in Fire Engineering uh, is true for the whole inquiry. There's been no thorough forensic inquiry at all into what took place. Yeah, hundreds of trucks every day, wasn't it, taking the steel? Oh, yes, it was. A- but I suppose you could say, you, you might say, well, this is an extraordinary event. Okay, normally where there's a crime, you keep to the law. <laughs> but uh, in this case, it was really extraordinary. And how could the city of New York get back to normality without removing this stuff? So, of course, they had to do that. Yeah, and that's a very plausible line of argument, uh, up to a point, as they say. Um, What we now know is that such was the urgency of the White House to get New York moving, Wall Street up and moving, the travel trade up and moving again, that they rewrote the warnings that had been issued by the Environmental Protection Agency about the toxic nature of what was left at Ground Zero and told people in terms that the air there was safe to breathe. And that was a flat lie. And good-hearted people, professionals and volunteers who went on to Ground Zero initially to try and find any survivors and then subsequently to find any trace that when it was clear they could not have survived, they're still dying, Julian. They're still dying 15 years later and have had enormous battles to get compensation for proper health care. And they went on there in a good-hearted, decently motivated way and were lied to by the White House, who told them it was safe to breathe. And the air palpably wasn't. 
Um, Absolutely. And I find that really shocking. And when a friend of mine's an environmental correspondent who's looking at this piece, he works in the mainstream media, so I'm not holding my breath that anything will appear. And he said, is there an environmental angle in this? I said, how about people still dying 15 years later from inhaling toxic dust? That's one of the many legacies of the terrible legacies of 9-11. I don't know whether you've seen it, the recent video series that James Corbett's put up at the Corbett Report <clears throat> about the 9-11 suspect. Yes, indeed. And, and of course, one of those is Christine Todd Whitman, exactly. who headed up the, the EPA at the time. And, uh, well, he makes the case persuasively, I think, that she was lying about it. Yeah. I mean, you can understand the dynamics of this. Journalist. I, tr I try to be balanced and yeah. you know, not judgmental that it was a terrible thing. It was a terrible shock to the Americans. They'd never had anything like that. I mean, when I lived in America and told them that some relatives of mine lived 25 miles away from Nazi Germany for four years during the war, they can't believe that kind of thing. Uh, they can't because America had not experienced anything like this. So you can imagine the sense of urgency of to say, well, we've got to prove to the world that we're back and we're back up on our feet. You know, we've been knocked down in the 10th round, but we're up and we're going to fight to the, that kind of mentality, which is part of the American can-do spirit, which I find very attractive and very admirable. You can understand all of that, but then 3,000 people have died. Um, the American defense system has been found to be grossly wanting. Um, there's a continuing legacy of the sick and dying because of all of this. And there are thousands of relatives who are wanting to know what happened. And their need to be satisfied in an answer to that is being pushed aside by the need to get New York up and running again. And there has to be a balance struck in that. And I think it wasn't a balance that was struck uh, in favour of frankness uh, or in, in favour of humanity for that matter. Mm course your the title of your piece is 15 years on do you think well a couple of questions here do you think after all this time it is still worth talking about this and secondly do you think there's any chance that there will be an investigation that does justice to this situation people have been asking this for you know a long long time now are we just wasting our time well first question first i think it is profoundly important that we try to get a better understanding of this because of the consequences of 9-11. Uh, we immediately had uh, an attack on Afghanistan, followed by Iraq. We had a clampdown on human freedoms in the United States through the Patriot Act. And we had similar pressures here, you know, pressure on MPs for detention without trial and all that kind of thing. And we still live in a world which we look at through the spectacles of the so-called war on terror and all that flowed. And 9-11 was a hugely symbolic uh, event in that area. And the consequences have been profoundly serious and continue to be. Um, I mean, the wars that followed in the Middle East, the huge problems that we're getting in Europe as a result of refugees, many of whom would not be refugees had we not been involved in the conflicts that followed on 9-11. So that's profoundly serious. Your second question is, it may be that we may never know. I think it may be that we never have another formal inquiry in the way of the 9-11 Commission, which is the, the call of many people who want to get to the bottom of this. But I think what is possible and has begun to happen already is that so many people with detailed knowledge of separate aspects of what went on that day have come forward. And I think in the popular mind, I mean, I'm hoping my piece gets this process started, that informally, uh, perhaps people will begin to say, well, that's what we were told about 9-11, but really the reality was very different and in future, we'll have more intellectual and emotional scepticism when it comes to a thing like this. And we'll ask Absolutely. more questions about what currently has gone on. And that subsequently happened with the Boston bombings. And, and sometimes the questioning is weighted and unfair. But I think we're right to be alerted to the possibility that things go on of which we told very little. And I know from working in the mainstream media that so many important issues are, are glossed over. And, you know, just a friend of mine lost his job on The Independent a few months ago, 
and hasn't been replaced in a very critical area of coverage of that newspaper. So I know the mainstream media aren't going to do it, but the online facilities, with the usual safeguards we've got to have, you know, that there's some crazy stuff out there and there are, there are people with too much time on their hands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and probably some of it deliberately planted as well, I should think. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's, I don't think there's any question that there's no. mischievous stuff done. But it's important to balance it. And when you mentioned, you know, the myths about 9-11, and I think people, just as they should look at the 9-11 Commission report in a critical way, they should look at that. They shouldn't swallow everything that everybody is saying. And they should reach a balance. And on balance at the end, I say, I don't see why, for example, two and a half thousand architects and engineers who've got businesses to run and fearful of losing government contracts would bother to put their names to something which is wanting a proper inquiry into what's going on if they didn't think it was important. So I think it is important. Uh, I think it's also true. Um, Chilcot was unusual to me in that in the lifetime of politicians we did get uh, an investigation of, of certain aspects of what led to the Iraq war and how that thing was dealt with uh, but politicians by and large don't want to continue to dig into the activities of their predecessors partly out of fear that their subject mm. <laughs> for them might begin to inquire rigorously into what happened well, and when they were in charge. But uh, we, we need to be guarded and be vigilant against that, I think. Yes, I do agree that it, it did seem to be much more hopeful than I was expecting it to be. Um, but, yeah. uh, but Craig, uh, it was interesting what Craig Murray said about it, that uh, he didn't go deep enough into the intelligence apparatus no. there, and uh, particularly the, we're moving subjects slightly here, but uh, you know, he, he was complaining about the normal filters that would filter out the dross of intelligence. Well, yes. that, those, those filters were removed, and he claims uh, deliberately, which seems highly plausible to me, in order to allow the over-suspicious material and unreliable material to come to the fore and affect policy. So it, in that sense, it's a disappointment that it didn't go that far. But um, I think that's true. But if you think, I mean, my, my sense is, you know, that we're Britain around the largest empire the world's ever known, uh, and we had educational institutions that bound a small number of people together to maintain that degree of, uh, not deliberate secrecy, but well, the rest of us didn't find out about a lot. And that is breaking down. I mean, the very fact that somebody like Craig Murray, a former ambassador, could be writing what he's writing, and the fact that in 9-11, you have some senior, I mean, the idea of the chief of staff of Colin Powell at the State Department, Lawrence Wilkinson, I mean, I do recommend people to see his stuff in particular. You know, he's a military man who served with Colin Powell. He wrote his speech at the UN where Colin Powell held up what people thought was a vial of anthrax and so on. And the stuff that Lawrence Wilkinson has said subsequently to undermine so much that went on in the Bush administration, I take as a very healthy sign yes. and that the new generation of politicians and journalists should have that as their starting point and say this is what people who actually were close to the action are actually doing and it's much less easy for the mainstream media and the political establishment to conceal things in the way that you know i grew up in and if it wasn't in the guardian it wasn't true <laughs> <laughs> right. you know from the guardian these days that uh, um they they have a rather limited focus in certain areas and uh, prejudicial in others some would argue but uh, um, you know people are i mean there are good i've trained a lot of journalists over the years and there are a lot of good journalists wanting to do a good job and they don't find it easy to do that and pay the bills so it puts a responsibility i think on the rest of us uh, to be supportive and, and make our own intelligent inquiries of things. Yes, yes. I'm glad you mentioned Wilkerson there because, you know, people may come across his material, perhaps interviews on YouTube, and not really be aware of his significance. So what I will do yeah. is I will draw attention to it on the show notes and perhaps embed an interview yeah. or something. Yes. I have seen some of his interviews and they are quite striking. Yeah, well, John Kiriakou, who was the head of the CIA station in Pakistan, who was jailed for whistleblowing, um, some of his stuff... Is extraordinary when you sit coolly and put links to his interviews on the real news, and but there's plenty of other stuff there. Um, and you think this is courageous stuff. Um, the people have got a career and they've, they've got to operate in a, a milieu in you know, I know what Washington's like inside the DC Beltway, um, not making life easy for themselves by saying this. And 
you have to respect people who tell us what really was going on. Much. Yes, indeed. Yes, a big risk being taken. Definitely. And the good thing is, the gratifying thing is that people are doing that, and I, I feel for them in their disappointment that it's not reached a wider audience. So my effort in doing this, and thank you for your time this morning with this, is to alert people to well, these people do exist, uh, as they exist in Britain. There are all kinds of people who've popped up from the underside of empire and who've told us this is not really what happened at Suez or this is not what happened in colonial Nigeria. Uh, and Lobster's been a home for a lot of those people in over many, many uh, years. Corinne Souza, who was a regular contributor to Lobster, she died a few years ago, was the daughter of an MI6 man in Baghdad. She grew up the daughter of a spy. Wow. The stuff that she's revealed about what goes on is extraordinary. A, a lot of that information is available for free at Lobster. It's absolutely, it? all for free because. Uh, is it? Or, or I yeah. thought you could only go back. I thought you could only go back so far, and then you had to request it in some way. No, the, the online edition. It's been an online magazine for many years now, um, and a lot of the print, when it was done in the old-fashioned print and post and distribute that way, was done. But a lot of that material, if you look online, it, it's readily accessible in other places as well for free. Oh. And it's a huge archive of, of worthwhile material, uh, I think, and pioneering material at its time. I mean, when uh, Lobster did stuff on Colin Wallace, um, that really was breaking terrible ground. And then Paul Foote picked up and ran with it and wrote a book about it. And then there was a film, and Colin Wallace was subsequently released from the... He'd be put up together on a manslaughter charge, which had been invented uh, because of what he disclosed about what the intelligence services were doing in Northern Ireland. Uh, and Lobster did all of that years and years ago, with no thanks from the mainstream media at the time. So I do recommend it as uh, as, as one important source, one amongst many uh, internationally, but there was an important source, I think. Mm. Yeah, I haven't looked into it very much. Tony Gosling actually did mention it to me a little while ago, but I, there's, obviously, as you say, there's an awful lot of information there to look yeah. into. Um, are a lot of the old print-based materials being scanned and uploaded, do you know? Yeah, they're, they are available. I mean, if you oh. to people hunt around, there are several places that don't immediately come to mind, uh, but they're, they're there and they can be accessed. Several people have scanned them and, and made them available. Uh, but they go back, I think, online for at least six or seven years and some of the bigger pieces that the editor Robin Ramsey's done they're available in, in other places too and of course he's written books on Wilson and Wallace and uh, uh, and uh, he's done a lot on on New Labour and uh, its various connections with the city and uh, with Israel and so on and uh, that they can all be readily accessed Great, yes, I shall obviously link to that. I just want to go back to, uh, before we close, you know, I asked you that question, well, what's the point in looking into all this after so much time? And you did touch on something that I was actually going to ask you, but yes. I will nevertheless kind of ask you again anyway. And I put this in a, you know, my interest in theology, so I sort of put it in these kind of theological terms. And my reason for doing this, you will immediately see, is that I see 9-11 as a kind of hermeneutical thing um, mm -hmm. in the sense that it's a kind of key to opening up a different way of understanding the world. Now, you did touch on this, mm -hmm. but I find this so helpful when I'm listening to the news. Just recently, there's been this business about, oh, you know, certainly uh, Russia has certainly attacked this aid convoy, you know. And I'm thinking, well, just a minute, nobody on the news is saying it could possibly be, I mean, I'm not saying I know what's happened there at all, no, no. but the question is not raised. Oh, could this have been done in order to implicate Russia and it's got nothing to do with them? Mm. Something like 9-11 has this hermeneutical function Mm. which allows one to think in different ways. And I, you've already mentioned it, I know, but I do think it's important to stress that even if we don't actually get this proper investigation that tells us exactly what happened that day or satisfactorily what happened that day, nevertheless, in allowing us to think in these different ways, hopefully it doesn't take us to complete scepticism, but nevertheless, it gives us this broader way and fairer way, I think, mm. of understanding the world where we look upon our own side, as it were, in inverted commas, you know, as being, well, possibly we're not quite as uh, good necessarily as we might be propagandized to think that we are. And I think that's a healthy state of affairs if we begin to think that way. You know, you, you know more about theology than, than I do, Julian. But I mean, I, I'm told I've never been in the, in, into the CIA lobby in, uh, in Langley, Virginia, but I'm told there they have a, a biblical inscription to say that the truth shall set us free. And I think it is true um, that it's 
dangerous to explore into areas in search of truth because it takes us away from security uh, in all kinds of different ways. But I think that's why we've got minds. Absolutely. <laughs> what a great way to end, actually. That is why we have minds. We have minds, and we are not to have those minds formed by somebody else and just sit there and not look into these things. And I think your article is an excellent invitation for people to do that. As I said before, it gives lots of links, um, lots of channels to follow without you telling people this is exactly what happened. So I think it's an extremely useful and extremely helpful article that you've written there. It's freely available, so I do highly recommend people go and read that. And indeed, share it it's a great resource to share with people because sometimes you know we think oh well, the best thing to share is a video well it isn't necessarily sometimes it is actually the written word and it's very approachable as well so thank you ever so much john for joining us thank you um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and i i hope it affords a at least a, an inquisitive uh, set of minds to explore further which is my intention yes excellent last thing then just before we close are you happy for people to get in touch with you if they want to talk about this article Yes, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Um, what would be the best way of doing that? I think if, if you approach, I mean, Lobster has got a link. If you go to Lobster magazine and any queries go to Lobster, which has an email address, and they'll find their way to me, that will be fine. That will be the simplest and most effective yes. way of doing it. Excellent. Good. Well, thank you very much, John, for both for thank coming you. on the show and for telling me about the article. And it's been a pleasure talking with you. And you, sir. Many thanks.